Good evening. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reform Presbyterian Church as we come together for our evening time of worship. And we'll continue tonight looking at the letter of 1 John. And before we do so, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your grace and for your mercy. We ask that you would continue to open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth. And that, dear God, that your Holy Spirit would apply these words unto our hearts we might again understand more about you and more about our faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as noted tonight, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 5. This is the last chapter of the letter of 1 John, and we will likely complete our time in 1 John uh, towards the end of September, and I'll uh, announce in the next couple of weeks where we're going to go after that. But uh, let's continue with 1 John chapter 5, verses 1. Hear the word of the Lord. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Amen. Well, as we come towards the end of this letter, it's important for us to remember what John is doing in this book. He is hoping to help these young Christians have confidence in their faith, be assured of their place in the kingdom, and to remember that there are many false teachers who are coming into the camp who want to lead them astray. And so he's provided throughout this letter three tests for the believer to apply to their own hearts and to examine their place in the kingdom. Now, in the last chapter here, he's going to kind of run through them again. And the first one he wants us to look at and to think about is faith. Now, what is faith? Faith is a holy resting and trusting, holy as in W-H-O-L-O-Y, a holy resting and trusting in Jesus Christ. Now, what do we trust Jesus Christ for? According to John, faith, true faith, is trusting that Jesus is the Christ born of God. And that everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. And so the focus here is not even so much on the kind of the um, mechanics of salvation. But it's about our love for God. It's about why we have been saved to begin with. We need to be careful about understanding the work of Christ as merely a means to an end. It wasn't just to get us a get out of hell free call. But the purpose of Christ's death and resurrection, the purpose of him being sent by the Father, the purpose of his eternal begottenness, is to bring glory to God and so that we would love God. Because you see, that's our problem. Our problem as humans is we don't love God. Right? We love the flesh and not the spirit. Right? We love the things of man and not the things of God. And a quick test to see where you are on the continuum, John is presenting you. Do you love Jesus Christ? And do you love Jesus Christ not as you have created him to be, but as he really is? One of the things sometimes you'll hear, and it's especially popular today, is this idea that Jesus is whatever you need him to be. Right? Sometimes you'll hear people say Jesus is my homeboy. 
that I'm uncool enough that I don't even know what that means. But you also hear people say that me and Jesus have a thing going on. And what that usually means is, is that Jesus is not overly concerned with my sin. He's okay with my sin. He doesn't care if I sin because he's Jesus and he's a God of love. And of course, our culture understands love as acceptance without judgment. And oftentimes they will go to John 3.17 to kind of confirm that idea of who Jesus is. In John 3.17 it says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Right? Jesus isn't here to condemn. Right? He's not here to judge anyone. He's just here to love people, and he's here to bring us into a right relationship with God. Well, think for a moment. Why would Jesus need to come into the world to condemn it? Because what was the world already? The world was already condemned. Right? The world was already condemned to hell fire for its sin. And what is the sin of humanity? Right? It's rebellion against God. It's hatred of God. It's hatred of the things of God. And of course, it goes all the way back to the garden. Right? What's the problem with Adam's sin? The problem with Adam's sin is he did not think the Lord God rated in his life. God was fine as far as he went. But Adam had his own thing going on in the garden. And we see that by the fact that he had not properly shepherded his wife and allowed her to fall into temptation with his serpent. Right? What did God tell Adam to do? Adam was told to have dominion over the garden. Right? And when we use that word dominion, we don't mean that he was supposed to lord it over Eve. Right? He was not supposed to be some kind of, kind of, kind of dictator and some kind of rude person. But he was given authority to shepherd Eve as her husband. To serve her in this way. And Eve's willingness to listen to the serpent is really a reflection more on Adam than it is Eve. And so when Adam took the bite of the apple, or the forbidden fruit, of course we don't know it's an apple, that's kind of tradition, but you know, when Adam takes a bite of that forbidden fruit, he wasn't doing anything that he didn't already set his heart towards doing. And so really the sin had already been committed. Because he had not faith in the living God. He trusted not in God Almighty to provide for him. Because God was not his first love. And it's worth thinking about in the context of 1 John. Because John here is the minister to, and he's more than likely writing to, the people of Ephesus. He's certainly writing the people of Ephesus in 2 John and 3 John. And Gaius is maybe, likely, a resident there. Right? He's not a minister. He's, an, he's a lay person, if you want to use those terms. And the elect lady and her children is referring to the church. And he also, of course, references Ephesus in the book of Revelation when Jesus writes to the seven churches. As a matter of fact, Ephesus is the first one to get mentioned. And there, in Ephesus... What is said to be the great sin of Ephesus? Right? That they had forgotten their first love. That they had forgotten the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for them. And everything else looked okay. But in reality, they were like the Pharisees who were pretty on the outside, but inside were full of dead man's bones. Because they had not the love of God in their heart. Right? Christ was not their first love. He was not the center of who they are. And John here is warning against this by saying whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Let's go back to the first couple of verses of that John 3 passage we just read. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And it's so important for us to focus on the prime mover of salvation. 
It is the Lord our God. Right? For God so loved the world. Right? What did we just get done talking about in 1 John chapter 4? In this is love, it says in verse, chapter 4, verse 10. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also have to love one another. Right? This is exactly what John is saying in chapter 5, and it's exactly what John records Jesus as having said in John chapter 3. Right? God is love. And what has God done for us? Sent his only begotten son to die for our sins, to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, propitiation is kind of a big word, right? It's so big I can barely even pronounce it most of the time. But what it means is the payment for sin. And propitiation is a term that was used in those days for payment for debt. And Jesus Christ is the payment for the debt that we owe our Heavenly Father, because of our sin in Adam and because of our own personal sins. And what has he done for us? Right? How does the cross of Paul describe this? Christ died for who? For the ungodly. And what did Jesus say about that? Right? Scarcely would a man die for, for a, you know, in, in that way. Now, when we think about that, what is our response to what God has done for us in Jesus Christ? Right? The primary thing that Christians are called to do is to love God and love their name. Everything else is born out of those twin statements. If you don't love God, you're not going to love your neighbor. And if you don't love your neighbor, it's because if you don't love God. And so beginning with the love of God, everything else flows from that. What does the first commandment say? The first commandment says... Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, can you serve both God and man? Of course, the Bible says no. And why is that? Because you'll choose one and love the other. And what's the nature of man that we see over and over again? If, I, if given a choice, live God or live man. Always man, always is, always is. Why? Because they're sinners and they love themselves more than the Creator. But if you love God first, everything else flows from it. Right? And that's John's point here. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, right? We are born from above. We are new creatures in Jesus Christ. We have a new identity in him. We are no longer that man who served sin, but we now serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Because remember again about the Ten Commandments. What comes before the first commandment? Right? The preface to the Ten Commandments. And our catechism lays out beautifully uh, what the preface to the Ten Commandments teaches us. The preface to the Ten Commandments teaches us what? That God called us out of bondage to sin, out of bondage to slavery in Egypt. And what did he do for us? He gave us eternal life. Gave us the promised land. Gave us everything. Because he loves us and seeks for us to love him. And how does John tell us we love the Lord our God? Again, what is this test of faith that he is putting here upon these young Christians? How do we live out our faith? We live out our faith in our obedience to the commandments. Do you love God? Do you commit adultery? Do you love God? Do you steal? Do you lie? Do you break the Sabbath day? Do you use the Lord's name in vain? Now when we think about that, I, I, can, I can hear the objection. Well, what about the rich young ruler, right? Didn't he do all that stuff? But what was his problem? What did he love? He loved his riches. And in fact, Jesus shows him that he doesn't actually keep those commandments anyway. Like he thinks he does, but he doesn't really do that. And of course, we in our fallenness don't keep them completely idle, right? John here is not foisting upon them a burden 
that they cannot keep. But again, he's using the commandments to show them not only their need for Christ, but he's using the commandments to show them that there better be fruit to that faith. Because what are Christians called to do according to the Apostle John? For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome, right? When we look at the law of God, is it a burden to us or is it a joy to us? Do we read the law of God and say, thank you, Lord, that I don't have to steal it? Do we look at the law of God and say, thank you, God, for providing a Sabbath day where I can rest from my earthly labors and I can find rest in you? Or do we look upon the commandments and say, Jesus, boy, I really wish I could steal. I won't do it for you, but, you know, man, I'd really love my neighbors, uh, whatever. His four wheel, his boat, whatever it is. And you harbor that in your heart and say, man, it, it, Jesus is keeping me from doing this. Now, is that the kind of thing that John has in mind here? Well, in a negative sense, yes. If our heart is like that, if we don't sin because we know Jesus doesn't like it, then we're totally missing the point. Christians should not steal because they love what God has provided for them in Jesus Christ. Right? That's what goes to the Tenth Commandment. In many ways, the Tenth Commandment undergirds all the rest of it. Why do we make false images of Jesus Christ? Why did Israel make false images? Because they coveted what the nations had. Right? The nations had giant statues to Baal and to Ashtaroth, and the Israelites wanted to be like their neighbors. Right? They coveted what their neighbors had. But what did their neighbors not have? They didn't have Jehovah. They didn't have the Lord their God. They didn't have Jesus. They didn't have any of the actual blessings of the covenant family. What did God do to these men and women who lusted after Baal? He gave them over to Baal. And how did that work out? Not only did it lead to the destruction of their children, but it led to the destruction of the nation itself. <coughs> and so the passage before us today is asking us this question again. Right? It's asking us to test ourselves and ask the question of our own faith. What is first in our lives? Is Jesus first in our lives? Is the Jesus of the Bible first in our lives? Because that's a difficult question sometimes for us to answer. But it's a necessary question. And what are we to do with those things that are causing us to sin? Right? Jesus tells us to cut our hands off that causes us to sin. And obviously, he doesn't mean that literally. But what are we told to do? To remove it from us? And what's the source of sin? Right? It's not what goes into a man, it's what comes out of it. The source of sin is our own heart. And so how do we do away with these things? Well, again, the, the answer is right here in the passage. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Right? The faith that has been given to us by the Lord our God is what moves us to overcome the old man. The victory over death. The victory over sin. And so how do we accomplish this? And what does faith do? Right? Faith rests and trusts in Jesus Christ. Right? Faith rests and trusts in the power of Christ to remove these idols from us. Right? Faith rests and trust in the means of God's grace. If we're having trouble organizing our lives in accordance with God's holy law and with his call upon our lives, then what do we need to do? We need to go to the commandment. What does the commandment say? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days the Lord our God has given to us to labor. And the seventh is a day of rest. And so we need to look down at our schedules, look down at our lives, and ask, 
Are we, re are, are we using the six days that God's given to us righteously? And are we ordering our lives so that the seventh day, right, the first day of the week in the New Testament, is the highlight of days? That's just one example here of, of the kind of thing John is wanting us to ask in, in our hearts. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Again, another aspect of this is the reality of the power of Jesus Christ in our lives. Do we really believe that Jesus is powerful enough to deal with our sin? What does Jesus say to the woman who came up to him and touched the hem of his garment? Right, your faith has made you well. And what did she believe? That if she just barely touched the hem of his garment, she would be healed. Think of the Gentile woman who uh, asked Jesus for the crumbs off the table. She understood that that was sufficient for what she needed. She didn't need the whole meal. She just needed Jesus. The centurion whom Jesus, whom Jesus is, is asked to heal his servant, what does he do? He says, you don't have to come to my house. I am a man under authority like you are. And what does Jesus say about that man's faith? I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel. And why is that? Because the centurion understood who Jesus was. That he was the son of God. And that the Son of God has power and authority over devils and over sin and over all things. He has the authority to give you the victory over these things. And what are you called to do? To rest and trust in Him. To rest and trust in the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of your own making. Because what happens to people who make a Jesus in their own image? And that Jesus lets them down. Why? Because they let themselves down. Because they don't have the power to do that within themselves. So brothers and sisters, as we uh, come to a close tonight in this section, we need to ask ourselves something about the nature of this word. We are called to love the Lord your God with all your mind and soul through Christ. It's only through Christ, it's only by Christ, and it's only in Christ that we have the victory. Anytime we try to mix ourselves in there, trouble comes. It is by grace through faith, and that by the gift of God, that men and women come to believe and retain that belief in Jesus Christ. Right? We don't get in by grace and stay in by works. Because if that was the case, none of us would cross the starting line. We'd fall right on our faces. Because we don't have the power within us. We're sinners. We're fallen creatures. Can we see in the love of God and in the love of the Son and the love of the Holy Spirit the call on our lives, on our hearts, on our minds, on our souls that we're to give all things to Jesus because all things belong to Him. Again, the commandments of God are the, the apex of this. Because that's really where the rubber hits the road. Do we trust the wisdom of God or the wisdom of man? Do we trust the law of God or the law of man? Look at all the societies built on the law of men. Where are they today? In ruins, collapsing under the weight of their own wickedness. The call is clear in the Christian life. We're not to live as the world lives, and we're not to believe as the world believes. We are called to rest and trust alone in the beautiful, perfect law of God, which your Father has given to you for your benefit and your blessing. And again, to drive this home point, why is all this true? Because Jesus is the Christ. Because Jesus is the Son of the living God. Because Jesus has laid down His life for your sin. He's washed you in His blood. 
and to the call that you have give, been given is to have faith in Christ, to rest and trust in him. This magnificent gift, which none of us deserve, but God has given to us by his love and by his grace. And love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. For this is the gift of Christ.